Okay, let's finish up 10,000 BC because, oh boy, this one's going to be a doozy. So, our protag makes his way across Africa and basically takes up a savior slash Moses role of liberating the peoples enslaved by this mysterious advanced culture. I do like the depiction of various diverse cultures and costumes present in Africa at this time, which is accurate. Africa has been home to humanity for millions of years, and anatomically modern Homo sapiens first appeared in Sub-Saharan Africa 200,000 years ago, if not older. So, Africa would be our oldest home, and doubtlessly home to many diverse cultures considering the amount of time groups had to develop into different peoples and tribes. I love the clothing in particular. The face paint and masks remind me of those of the Homo sapiens in A Quest for Fire, who I believe also were intended to be African if not having a recent African origin. The movie's geography just like this one is a bit vague and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Anywho, we encounter large wooden sailboats traveling up the Nile. This is interesting to say the least. When humans started using boats is a little unclear at the moment. It has been somewhat suggested that Asian Homo erectuses 800,000 years ago might have used primitive raft structures to travel great distances across oceans to reach islands. But as far as I know, this isn't entirely accepted. The clearest and earliest usage of rafts and boats by humans was in Homo sapiens 42,000 years ago. Evidence of advanced deep sea fishing technology, in particular fish hooks designed for catching huge deep sea fish, such as tuna, discovered in East Timor, demonstrates that some early early humans had a very advanced maritime knowledge and experience for their time. Additionally, the fact Australians and other human groups were able to reach such far-off places so long ago also seems to support the idea that at least some early humans had a pretty good idea of uh, boat skills and traveling across the oceans. Considering that was 30,000 years before this movie is set, it is likely boats and rafts were still being used and probably advanced slightly since then. These prehistoric boats, however, were likely not the type seen in the film. They were probably more like wooden platforms and canoes. It's likely that a primitive version of a sailboat or sail raft existed around this time, but we have no evidence to suggest that massive sailboats, like those in the film, had been invented yet. I will give credit when credit is due, as 10,000 BC at least got it correct that the Egyptians were the first to invent sailboats. The oldest depiction of a sailboat comes from the Egyptians at around the 5th millennium BC, and looked a lot like how they look in the film. So 10,000 BC gets, uh, meh, not entirely inaccurate, but not entirely accurate either. The environment of North Africa itself at this time was likely an arid desert as it is today, and as the film depicts. But it wasn't always like this. Just a few thousand years after this film, from about 7,500 to 7,000 BCE to about 3,500 to 3,000 BCE, a period of rain and water allowed blood to flow into the vast lifeless wasteland that we know today. This green or wet Sahara would have supported a savanna-like environment filled with many species of animals like antelopes, rhinos, lions, and giraffes, and etc. that survive further south to this day, but in an area that would become, in just a few thousand years' time, the largest and most inhospitable locations on the planet. This isn't an inaccuracy, I just thought it was an interesting fact, and something to think about if this film was set just a few thousand years later. Alright, enough playing around, let's talk about Egypt in 10,000 BC. Egypt didn't exist, like, at all. The ancestors of what would become in several thousand years of the Egyptians were no more than hunter-gatherers and primitive farmers living along the Nile at this time, still using stone tools and nowhere close to advanced as the people shown in the movie. They didn't have metal weapons, they didn't have thousands if not millions of slaves under their control, and certainly didn't have pyramids or other massive constructions. They probably didn't even have a unified king or pharaoh yet. To get an idea of what the most advanced structure built by any humans around this time was like, look no further than Golbeki Tepe? Golbeki Tepe. Golbeki Tepe. I swear, people name these things just to make my job harder. In southern Turkey. This Stonehenge-like structure was likely the very first religious sites, a prehistoric Mecca, for a religion or religions long forgotten. It is one of the oldest surviving structures built by human hands, and was just at the beginning of its construction around the time this film is set. This is about as advanced as you can get around this time, so forget cities, temples, ziggurats, and pyramids. The oldest Egyptian pyramid ever constructed was not the great towering pyramids of Giza, but the Pyramid of Djoser near Memphis, which was built from about 2630 BC to 2611 BC under the Third Egyptian Dynasty. 
an entire 8,000 years after this movie. The real Great Pyramids, which are the ones seen in the film, were built a bit later. The Great Pyramid of Giza being built from about 2580 to 2560 BCE under the 4th Dynasty. The slightly smaller Pyramid of Khafra being built from about the same time. And the last Great Pyramid of Menkora being constructed in 2510 BCE. The Sphinx was also likely built within this time frame. Suggesting the pyramids existed as far back as 10,000 BC is simply absurd. It would be several thousand years until the Egyptians became something more than fishers, farmers, and hunters, and even more until they became great architects and builders. Now I know what you're about to say. This film doesn't say these guys are Egyptians, but instead claims they are either ancient aliens or Atlanteans. Which I first of all think is kind of offensive to Egyptians by basically discrediting all their achievements and saying they basically stole everything from another culture, but I digress. Based on the map we see later in the film, we can accept the Atlantean conclusion is most likely due to the presence of a landmass in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, which I assume is where these people are from. The entire Atlantean thing is an entire different can of worms and inaccuracies that I think is pretty futile to discuss, but guess what, I'm going to do it anyways. Atlantis simply didn't exist, and there is no lost continent in any recent history that existed in the middle of the Atlantic. The whole entire concept comes from Plato's largely allegorical and metaphorical works concerning hubris and pride, and the story has no real basis and was likely intended to be a fictional and cautionary tale as opposed to history. The concept of Atlantis might have been inspired by several historical events, most notably the records of the Minoan eruption, one of the largest volcanic eruptions in recent history occurring in about 1642 to 1540 BCE. The eruption spelled chaos for several ancient cultures, including the early Greeks, Minoan civilization, and Egyptians. Apocalyptic rains, tsunamis, and earthquakes devastated many Mediterranean civilizations, and the subsequent volcanic winter caused great starvation across the land, with its effects possibly even being experienced as far away as China. Ash from the eruption would have covered the skies for weeks if not months, and it would seem as if the world was ending as dynasties and governments simply fell into ruin as a result. Chinese historians from around that time claim to have seen yellow fog, a dim sun, then three suns, frost in July, famine, and the withering of all five cereals. How impactful this eruption was is a bit unclear as records of it are few and far between, and often have been greatly mythologized, but its effects based on the volcano itself were probably a bit like the Mount Tambora eruption during the early 19th century, which caused the year without a summer, and killed thousands of people. The Minoan eruption event probably was the primary influence on Plato's Atlantis story, not a real historical Atlantis out in the middle of the ocean. So please people, stop claiming Atlantis existed because it didn't. These people additionally are hinted to have made transatlantic voyages long before Columbus or Leif Erikson, which is very inaccurate. Pre-Columbian transoceanic contact did exist, notably the exploits of the Vikings to North America, and evidence has been found suggesting the Vikings interacted with Native Americans centuries before Columbus. However, any crossings before the 11th century CE is pretty absurd, especially one in prehistory. Also, these people being ancient aliens makes even less sense, but deep down I was rooting for it. While watching this movie, I was half expecting the Almighty, said to be the last member of the Atlantean alien culture, to take off his mask and reveal himself to be a gray alien. Dun dun dun. I would have loved that. But sadly, all we get is some white old guy. If you're not going to try to make it accurate, then I say, take it all the way, baby. Just want a big, dumb, gray alien walking around in front of this Egyptian temple. Uh, yeah, with mammoths and stuff. <sighs> I could make a totally better movie than this movie. However, while we are here, let's instead assume these are Egyptians and evaluate the movie's depiction as a representation of Egyptian culture during the 2000 BCEs and see if this is, in itself, accurate. Well, guess what? Nope. First of all, is this image that Egyptians were brutal slave owners. It's pretty clear Roland was looking to emulate the Exodus story of the Hebrew Bible, adapting it into a prehistoric version, basically. Now let's talk about that, though. I think the Egyptians in general get a bad rap when it comes to history. You can basically never find a movie or a TV show or even some artwork that doesn't depict the Egyptians as primarily cruel slavers. The problem is that this image of the Egyptians being solely brutal slave owners whose entire empire was built on the backs of other people is something that is somewhat unwarranted by actual history. Sure, they had slaves and they didn't treat them particularly well, but this isn't anything special or unique for the time. Every nation owned slaves. Egyptians probably weren't any more brutal to their slaves than the Israelites, Mesopotamians, Chinese, Greeks, the later Romans, and basically every other culture in ancient history. 
That certainly doesn't excuse their actions one bit, as slavery is slavery, no matter who's doing it or what time, even if it seems socially acceptable at the time. But what I find strange is that it has become such a major part of how we view Egyptian culture. You can't really find any real reference to Egyptians and pop culture in general without seeing slavery attached to it, which is unlike most other ancient cultures depicted in media, who obviously did have slaves and were no different than the Egyptians. I think the reason why Western culture seems to single out the Egyptians in particular is mainly due to how they are portrayed in the Hebrew Exodus story, which for centuries was considered to be historically accurate up until only recently, and for centuries was the only source of what people knew about Egyptians, and to still some extent is the only source of what a lot of people in the United States only know about the Egyptians. Historians have been able to uncover that the Exodus story is largely fictional. Archaeologists, a good amount of them being Jewish themselves, haven't found the slightest bit of evidence to support hundreds of thousands of Israelites being enslaved in ancient Egypt, nor them being freed by a Moses figure, nor them traveling across Sinai to their holy land, and nor any signs of Egypt's armies being destroyed by a massive flood, nor any remains supporting the death of all firstborn Egyptians. And it doesn't appear like the Israelites were ever even in Egypt in the first place. The earliest evidence we have of the Jewish people starts in Canaan during the 13th century BCE, where they appear to not have any distinctly Jewish culture or identity, as they still used a Canaanite alphabet and artistic styles, and even appear to still have worshipped the Canaanite god El, and not the Hebrew one of Yahweh just yet. The only distinguishing trait they have from their Canaanite neighbors, in fact, is the lack of any pig bones or remains in their junk piles. A Jewish tradition that appears to be one of the oldest and the first. I apologize if I offended anyone in this discussion. I just think it is important to look at the facts and the evidence before anything else. Please don't take this as an attack against religion, I am merely stating the evidence. Anyways, the entire basis of how we used to view Egyptian history appears to be evidently fundamentally wrong. But because history is written by the victors, the ancient Egyptians were essentially demonized after several generations of dogma. This stigma against ancient Egyptians is unfortunate as they were a rather amazing culture that made major advancements in technology, science, medicine, and architecture. Slavery was a rather minor part of their culture, all things considered, and they weren't solely used for labor, as most depictions would make you think. Professor Annie Killebrew says in her book Biblical Peoples and Ethnicity, a slave fulfilled a multitude of roles in ancient Egyptian society, from menial tasks to key service roles in the royal household, to serving as a member of the priesthood. In the case of the Great Pyramids, unlike 10,000 BC and most media portrays, slave labor was not used in its construction. It is a well-known myth that originates all the way back to the 5th century BCE by ancient Greek historians and still persists to this day. Modern historians have found that the Great Pyramid of Giza, at least, was not built by slaves, but tens of thousands of skilled and educated workers who were well-fed, well-paid, and might have been composed of mainly volunteers who took great pride in their work, as there was an almost civil and moral obligation to the pharaoh, probably analogous to serving in the military in today's world. Archaeologists uncovered a worker's village in the shadow of the Great Pyramid, which would have been the home to these workers. This village contained almost all the necessities of a self-sufficient town, with sleeping areas, bakeries, breweries, kitchens, a hospital, and a cemetery. The evidence shows that bread, beer, beef, and fish were served to these workers every day. This goes to show you how important these workers were to the pharaohs, as beef was considered a luxury item and would have been a better diet than most of these men would have had in their own village. It has been estimated that 11 cattle and 37 sheep or goats were consumed by the workforce every day. Needless to say, these workers were not doing this against their will, nor unrewarded for what was definitely hard work. The Egyptians simply couldn't have uneducated slaves working on the pyramids, because the job was just way too complex and advanced. Skilled mathematicians and engineers had to be used to make the pyramids, as it was super easy to make a geometric mistake at the bottom that would spell disaster for the rest of the structure, by making it uneven and crooked. The pyramids were likely also not built by hundreds of thousands of people either. The evidence shows that it was more likely a workforce of 10,000 working in 3-month shifts, with the overall build taking 30 years per pyramid. Most of these workers would be supporting workers like bakers, carpenters, toolmakers, scribes, water carriers, and farmers, who would supply the necessary materials to keep the operation running. Advisors and project leaders would have accompanied the entire process, and it would make a very organized build. Definitely not the chaotic monstrosity of an operation seen in 10,000 BC in other media. The construction sites of the pyramids might have resembled something more like a bustling city 
filled with many diverse professions and divisions of labor with some formal training and for a decent wage than an overcrowded prison for slaves. We are not sure exactly how the pyramids were built, but we have a decent idea that definitely doesn't require ancient aliens or mammoths. 10,000 BC depicts the external ramp theory. Egyptologists believe ramps were used in the moving of blocks quarried on site, but little evidence of the ramps survived, so we don't know exactly how they were designed at the time of the construction. Spiral ramps, wide ramps, thin ramps have all been proposed, but none of them have been extensively proven. A few smaller ramps have been unearthed at Gaza, notably one composed of largely sand and gypsum, used to transport stones from the quarry to the base of the Great Pyramid. However, anything truly extensive hasn't been unearthed yet. It is possible an external ramp existed, but was largely destroyed after the construction. The annoying thing is, is just how long ago this occurred, so both archaeological evidence and contemporary accounts are so few and far between. The one of such great size in 10,000 BC might be accurate or inaccurate for all we know. One thing to note is while the blocks were being pulled up these ramps using wooden sledges by a team of workers, some workers in front would wet the sand in front of the sledge with water, as wet sand has significantly reduced friction than dry sand, making the job much easier and requiring half the amount of workers. You can even see depictions of this wet sand method in Egyptian artwork. The wooden sledges used to drag stones have been both depicted in artwork and a few have been discovered, all of them having anchor points for ropes, which were pulled by workers to reduce the required energy. This appears to be something in the film. Inland canals and harbors for ships and boats that transported larger stones not quarried on site have been discovered, something somewhat present in the film, but I don't think is extensive enough. It is also important to know that the stones used in the construction project did not have to be dragged far, as most of the pyramids were made of stones of limestone and sandstone, quarried, as said before, on site, only a stone throw away from the structures themselves. Egyptologists have actually found the ancient diary of an official who worked on the Great Pyramid's construction, and a lot of it was able to confirm what was already theorized by archaeologists. The Diary of Merer is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, papyrus documents ever unearthed. The author of the diary was a government official by the name of Merer, who was involved in the construction of the Great Pyramid. He led a crew of 200 men and basically worked as an ancient truck driver, using a boat to transport limestone and, in addition, likely food up and down the Nile to be used at the construction site. His diary has given very valuable insight into the day-to-day -day lives of the workers over a period of three months. From his writings, we know that the sailors working on the Nile frequented the workers' village near the pyramids. Merer also makes references to figures at the time, like the half-brother of the pharaoh, whom the Great Pyramid was commissioned by. Merer additionally discusses the taxes used to pay workers, and the workers, as previously discussed, ate large amounts of sheep. Merer considers himself loved by a decent amount of his employees, but I think he might have a bit of a bias on that one. Unlike the film, it is unlikely animals were used in any large capacity in the construction of the pyramids. Woolly mammoths, which did actually exist at the time of the Great Pyramid's construction, definitely would not have been involved in its construction, as they only existed on an isolated island far to the northeast in Siberia. One illustration within the tomb of Rekemeyer has been used to entertain the idea that mammoths once met Egyptians, but it is more likely this creature is a depiction of an African elephant, an artistic liberty, or a late surviving dwarf Mediterranean elephant. As far as we know, there is no evidence Egyptians ever met nor transported woolly mammoths and definitely did not domesticate them for labor. The golden capstone depicted, not just in this film, but in many depictions of the Great Pyramids, has been a bit of controversy as far as its accuracy goes. A lot of Egyptian pyramids possess capstones or pyramidions, and were often the last and most valuable part of their construction. Most capstones were made of valuable stones like granite, diorite, and limestone, and were covered with even more valuable materials, specifically gold or electrum. During the daytime, it would appear to glow like a star or the sun above the pharaoh's tomb, playing into these men's status of gods on earth. The Great Pyramid's capstone has been reportedly missing for a while, some reports suggesting it was missing since the 1st century CE. The capstone could have been gold-encrusted granite or some other valuable stone back in the Egyptians' heyday, and due to its apparent worth, was the first part of the pyramids to be looted at times of crisis. The capstone of the third largest pyramid, the Red Pyramid, belonging to Senefru, has been discovered but very badly damaged, again suggesting they were the first to go when order disappeared. The pyramid is still under construction in 10,000 BC, and due to the tradition of this being the last part of the pyramid, they likely wouldn't be on top of the pyramid just yet. That map of the world I referenced earlier is not only inaccurate due to the fact 10,000 BC keeps on suggesting an extremely advanced transatlantic culture existed thousands of years ago, but also wouldn't be accurate even if such a culture existed. The modern outlines of land masses on this map may or may not be accurate for 12,000 years ago. You have to remember that the film is set at the tail end of the last glacial maximum, and the beginning of the late glacial maximum, and the still melting ice sheets might have altered the coasts of the planet slightly. 
The ocean levels were a bit different back then. The British Isles, for instance, would still have been connected to mainland Europe, with what is known today as Dodgerland, which wouldn't disappear under the ocean until 6500 to 6200 BCE. If you want to see what the oldest maps of the world actually look like, well, just look at the Babylonian map of the world dating to the 5th millennia BC. Yeah, try to figure out what that says. Really helpful, right? And yeah, I think that's it for this movie. It completely butchers prehistory and history when you look at the facts. And yeah, I don't, I'm not even going to bother counting up the inaccuracies for this because it's just a long list. From like some rather stupid and minor things to some really huge and kind of, you know, could misinform people things. I really hope you enjoyed this series. I know some people didn't like this series, and some people did. I personally wasn't expecting it to go this much into history. I thought it was going to be more about the animals and biology, but I'm always a fan of ancient history, so I'm not complaining. I learned a ton, and I'm happy I did a whole bunch of research, and I hope you're happy you learned something too. However, some of my fans aren't a huge fan of human stuff, so meh. Tell me what you thought of this series. I really want to do a video like this talking about the Walking With series, but I'm not sure if I will continue after that. Tell me what you think. I could really do with some input, so please tell me if I should continue reviewing movies in this fashion, or, you know, give up on this. I'm definitely going to talk about the Walking With series, so you can't, you can't change me on there. My next video is going to be a paleo profile, and probably another biology thing after that, so stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.